2018 budget been approved. Do you support eliminating CDBG a program in use since 1974? Please explain how rural America will replace will replace structure such as water and sewer without that sort of grant program. Thank you for the question. So President Trump released his 2018 budget back in February of 2017. They always do it for the next fiscal year. So it's important to remember that by law, a president has to offer a budget, but it doesn't become law. It's just kind of a blueprint, a roadmap of what an administ any administration, any president wants to see. Priorities. It's Congress who does the budget. I'm on the Appropriations Committee, and so we appropriate the funds once we get our uh, know what our budgetary numbers are from the budget committee within the U.S. House. And so uh, the president has been pretty aggressive uh, in taking out a lot of different programs that um, a lot of them that I think need support in rural Iowa, particularly rural development funds, U.S. Department of Agriculture. He took a, about a 21% whack at that, but thankfully it doesn't become law. That's what Congress is for. So, Congress kept CDBGs, you mentioned that, Community Development Block Grants, kept Community Service Block Grants as well, which are kind of block grants for some of our social services. So we kept a lot in a bipartisan way of what the President didn't see as a priority. And so <coughs> now the President is going to be issuing his fiscal year 2019 budget here in on February 12th, he's supposed to do that. So it'll be a roadmap, a blueprint, and you'll hear a lot of folks, even yourself, say, hey, the president is not making this a priority or that a priority within his budget, and we need to make sure that Congress knows that. And so a lot of people come out and will say, hey, we sure hope you'll support this program, that program. Now, there's a finite amount of money, of course, and um, but within the budget, in a bipartisan way. Now, you talk about rural America, <coughs> infrastructure particularly, Justin. Now, the president is really right, right in the middle of kind of rolling out the infrastructure priorities and how to do that funding, He's trying to be very creative with the funding, public-private partnerships, pilot activity bonds, things like that. I think you're going to see um, he wanted to invest a trillion dollars in infrastructure. It's a lot of money. I don't think... I think it's going to be a combination of, of how that is added up with the private activity bonds and the public-private partnership and some funding coming from Congress as well. So I just met with the um, director of the Office of Management and Budget, kind of the president's budgetary wizard or guru. 
And I wanted to make sure that when these infrastructure plans were rolled out by the president, that rural America was not forgotten. And that I thought it should be go beyond just roads and bridges, which are very important, of course. We want to make sure that we have safe roads and bridges for our families. As well, we have a lot of commodities, a lot of goods. We want to get them to market, right? We see them, we see them piled up out here, that gold that we see stacked up. We want to get it to market. Of course, we need that. getting new markets is another story altogether, but we want to make sure that we get it to market. And so, um, I hope this is a combination of roads, bridges, dams and levees, water infrastructure, airports, people are talking about making sure our, our power grid is secure, um, things like that. And, and I want to make sure that there's a commitment to rural America. Now, I, I was listening to the president when he addressed the American Farm Bureau. Uh, he was talking about his commitment to rural America. Now, that's great, but you got to follow that up with action, right? And some of that's going to be on the... <laughs> so this is going to be on Congress as well, because we're going to be the ones developing that package in the end. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Do you want to give me your background as why uh, this issue is important to you? Uh, you don't have to. No, that's fine. Okay. I own and operate Crane Construction, Stickler Concrete, and the Clare and the Shenandoah area. Uh, the greater portion of the work that we do is for municipalities. Um, employ around 25 <laughs> people. And to see CDBG zeroed out yeah. in this proposal, but just is a little alarming. Um, and been looking for answers as to the future of yeah. the business that I have. Yeah. So, um, you know, when President Obama rolled out <coughs> his budgets, you, you saw folks within his own party question a lot of it, and just as you're saying right now, Republicans question some of the things that President Trump is putting in his budgets. There you go. It's, it's interesting to look at. I, I respect the fact that with a $20 trillion debt, you want to be aggressive and try to have some fiscal soundness, but it can't be a cliff. It's got to be a body cap, in my opinion. Truthfully, I was paying less attention during that administration, and not because of anything other than uh, it seems it's such a radical move. Uh -huh. that, that it's definitely a concern. Well, um, there's going to be continue to be CDBG funding, and there's bipartisan support for that. Um, spending so you want to go ahead and just well I, give me your thoughts and we can make this just yeah I'm with discussion I'm with the Department of Transportation Commission I was appointed last May and our discussions are always about you know roads and of course we do trailways and we do railroads and, and bridges but all of our bridges are meeting their maximum life expectancy in the next probably eight to ten years because they usually are built or in the past when they built them they expected to survive 50 years without doing some major either replacement or uh, refurbishing. So we're looking at that, and that's why um, President Trump had talked a lot about infrastructure spending and putting a lot of money into infrastructure. We heard a lot about it at the beginning of the administration, but I hadn't heard much lately and didn't know. And you kind of addressed a, a little bit with the other individual. But I just wonder what your thoughts. Yeah, so I think that's going to be, he has said, the priorities for his priorities for this are dealing with the dreamer issue and dealing with the infrastructure. And uh, I want to see him be more aggressive with finding trading partners <clears throat> rather than losing any kind of partners because um, <coughs> trade is very important to the, the third district, to the heartland, as you know. All right, we're done. <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, we have five issues for veterans in general, and I've given you a copy of it, or Charlie has a copy of it, okay. but it's for being in the budget committee on the House side, it's for troop strength, uh, don't change a 9-11 GI bill, which we're talking about changing, uh, don't increase co-payments, 
And then we talked, uh, the VA is talking about putting aging warnings on hold for a while. Uh, and that's going to affect thousands and thousands of veterans across the United States in the VA system. And then the financial penalties uh, for veterans in service that have been wounded and like legs missing and they're not 20 <coughs> years in service yet. So there's that gray area in there and they're being penalized in their payments for concurrence. Mm -hmm. There's two things I left off of there. That, and one of them is DACA, that you know we've spent 10 years, we've got 210,000 veterans in the state of Iowa, and in the past 10 years we have surveyed them. And 70% of the veterans in the state of Iowa is willing and on merit-based DACA thing for people to stay. Speak English, have a job, not be on welfare, and have a high school education and they're going to go ahead and say stay. And if you don't have that, five years to get it. And then if you don't have that, you're not. Uh, the other thing is women's health. We've got two million women veterans. We've had, uh, two, we've got 200,000 female veterans on active duty today. And that's a 30% increase since the year 2000. By 2050, it could be 40% of our, our, health, our uh, service uh, with women, female veterans. And they are totally left out of the VA health system as far as their needs. And one example, we built a, a female veteran's CBOC in Corville. And we thought it'd take three years before it was successful. In six months, it was completely <clears throat> packed full. And we had female veterans from seven states coming in. That's just an example of how important that is. And being the budget guy, I hope you can give them some consideration. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for all your service as well, <clears throat> for being such an advocate as well. We've had some meetings about trying to get the to bolster the outpatient clinic here. I'm not going to give up with you. So thank you for holding me accountable to help hold the VA accountable on that. Um, with the issues that you raised, the last one you raised about <coughs> women's health, um, I'm going to see the director of the VA hospital in Des Moines here within the next week, I believe. And um, I'll bring this issue up. Uh, I would encourage as well, uh, particularly women, female veterans, to have them contact me and, and um, regarding their particular okay. concerns as well. We'll put that information. Will you? Yeah. Okay. I do know, um, <clears throat> kind of on the back end of, of women's health with the military, we do a lot of funding with the Department of Defense budget for, for research uh, on causes of, of diseases that may be partially service-connected and funding for breast cancer research and cervical cancer research and that kind of thing. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and I would like to tell the group here, for our veterans clinic in Shenandoah, Iowa, would not exist if it wasn't for Congressman David Young. Well, the clinic would be there if it was there before. But <laughs> we're, 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 we're working together. <clears throat> so thank you for that. Um, I've heard more, more about Agent Orange lately as well. Uh, there's a couple pieces of legislation that I'm on. Uh, that are very bipartisan to bring that to the forefront of the VA. Well, Dr. Sultan has made a statement in an interview that he may look at putting Agent Orange on hold. Mm -hmm. And my gosh, that's just unbelievable. Anything but that. <laughs> so, whether it comes true or not, that's a concern out of our 10 issues at the national level. Anybody have any other questions that you just want to start? Okay, go ahead. I've got a question about that. Yeah. You know, there seems to be kind of a you know, two-headed coin. You know, you've got the situation where, according to Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, 69,000 factories closed to, in the United States as a result of NAFTA and cheaper wages, obviously, in Mexico. But then you have the other side of it, <clears throat> where NAFTA has been very beneficial to the farm economy. So this constant back and forth by the administration on whether they're going to you know, renegotiate, whether they're going to back away. 
where do they stand and, and how do you see that? Well, right now they're in about the sixth round of NAFTA negotiations. Uh, the president, as you know, says he doesn't like multilateral agreements. He said that when he was running for office, and he's pretty much kept his word on that since he's been elected. Particularly, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a multi-12 country trade agreement that the president, President Obama, was negotiating and had negotiated. And President Trump said, "Not going to do it." He said, "I don't like bilateral agreements." Well, good. But let's get on those bilateral agreements. Let's start that. Because every day you're behind, uh, the rest of the world is getting ahead of you on that. So we need, to, we need to really engage. So he's talked about getting rid of NAFTA. Uh, I don't think that that would be a good thing. I think that would be disastrous for our economy, particularly our agriculture economy that, you know, has hit some, some walls here and there with, um, you know, agriculture income being down four years in a row, the price of commodities right now. Now, we need markets. We can't consume all of this. I don't mind the president making sure that our trade agreements are being enforced. If there's certain titles and sections of, of our trade agreements in different industries that need to be we looked at, I'm okay with that. Make sure they're strengthened and being enforced. But I hope that he's got the message that um, you know, there, there is a good group within Congress who, on both sides of the aisle, pretty bipartisan, who believe in, in markets and trade. Mm -hmm. Aggressive trade, but fair trade. And you have to remember that when we're negotiating trade agreements, you, there will be concessions made. Not everybody is going to win on every political thing, right? But in the end, if you can find that your country is going to do better, then that's the step forward that, that we take and other countries take as well. I think um, from some of the things that I've read about Detroit starting to manufacture cars again, bringing them up from Mexico, uh, some of those, those plants, hey, I think that's great. Um, I think with the new the tax relief bill that was out there that came through, uh, the relief for our larger job providers and for our small businesses as well, that People are going to start, and they have talked about some major investments here in America as well, to start bringing back some manufacturing and um, the bonuses and wage increases. And over time, we'll see, I think our economy, we're growing at 3%, we're even higher. But you have to have that three-legged stool of a common sense, non-punishing tax code, common sense, non-punishing regulatory code, and you have to have a trade. That's the three-legged stool you need. So we're all watching, and we're all sending signals to the president. And, uh, I'm hoping that also when the president went to address the American Farm Bureau, that he heard from folks how important it is to have trading partners and increase markets. I w would feel a lot better, too, if our USDA secretary, Secretary Purdue, was in the room every time the word tr trade was brought up, when it, whether it was with President Trump or Secretary <coughs> Chen or our trade rep might <clears throat> But we need more trading partners. Enforce our agreements, yeah. But 90% uh, of the market, people out there, the markets out, are outside our borders. That's where we need to go. Our values, our goods need to be out there. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess I would just echo that. I'm, I, Michael Johnson, I'm really involved with the Farm Bureau. And uh, I was actually in Japan last year, a year and a half ago, and discussing with some of the agriculture people there, TPP issues, mm -hmm. and uh, I can't say there's a lot of things that I so liked about what Obama was doing, but I thought that was a really good move forward. And one of the things they talked about was how if this didn't happen, and this was in, in, in Japan, the officials we were meeting with, China is really going to be setting the stage because they're right there and they're setting up these agreements over there. And we take a step back from six years of or whatever it was of trade negotiations working on this, and I guess it was it was disappointing. I mean, it wasn't unexpected because it was clear it was stated, but it was disappointing because trade is such a huge part of the agricultural agricultural economy. Um, and I'd also, I guess, just like to ask you where you are as far as the, the 2018 Farm Bill. I don't know how involved you are at this stage of those things, but um, 
that is something that's, that is important to us as the Farm Bureau as well as farmers. Yeah. So every five to seven years, we, we, we write a new farm bill. And um, the reason why we do it every five to seven years because we analyze the policy and see if it works or doesn't work. You know, 15 years ago, you never heard of things like precision agriculture or people weren't really thinking about it to cover crops. And so as these things, technologies move, we update um, our farm programs. And that's always married to SNAP as well, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So I'm not on the Agriculture Committee. Um, Congressman King is on the Agriculture Committee from the delegation, and then Senator Grassley and Senator Ernst are also on the Agriculture Committee. So I am on the Appropriations Committee, though, and I'm on the Subcommittee of Agriculture, which takes a look at whatever is, is in the farm bill and our farm, farm programs we're obligated um, to fund. <clears throat> so a big issue for me is to make sure that we have that solid security of property. That's important. Uh, I'm trying to educate some of my colleagues in more urban areas a lot less important. Um, if you di didn't have it, and, and there's got to be skin in the game from everybody on this. But if you didn't have it and there was a natural disaster, a drought, or a flood, it's going to cost the taxpayers more because FEMA is, is going to be called a disaster and FEMA is going to come in and there's going to be a bailout. It's going to cost more. So, um, as well, I want to, I'm looking at water quality issues. I know the state has done some things here. Now, I don't want to manage Iowa's waterway or any other state's waterways from Washington, D.C., because I don't want somebody from New York as well voting on what we're doing in Iowa. But within the Agriculture Department, there's an account called EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, and that uh, gives grants for water quality, soil conservation. And I have a pilot pro project of the Water Quality Conservation Act, which targets a lot of that funding to whole watersheds, because I think that's you have to have a real holistic approach and target watersheds. So that's one of my issues that I'm working on. In Iowa State, there are land grant universities that kind of manage that. I've got Des Moines Waterworks on board with it, the Farm Bureau on board with it, Nature Conservancy, the Iowa Corn Growers. The money comes, and we handle it here. Um, so those those are two of the issues that I'm particularly concerned about and focused on. But there's going to be other issues that, that come up. Um, art payments, you see that the big differences along county lines, um, that needs to be corrected. And actually, Senator Ernst has been really aggressive on helping to correct that. But give me some of your comments about what you are concerned about and what you don't like currently and would like to see. <coughs> In regard to the farm bill, yeah. uh, I think, well, I think you touched on, to me, the, the biggest one is, is making sure that the crop insurance program is adequately <coughs> funded and stabilized. <coughs> and I do agree that it, it, there needs to be, there needs to be, I mean, it, you sound like it's free or by any means, but it's, uh, it's incentivized to the point where it, it, let, it encourages people to take protection, to protect themselves and to make sure that things remain stable. Um, as far as the, the water quality things, I, I'm, it's, a, it's a major priority issue for, for the Farm Bureau, but I do think, like you said, it, it needs to be locally driven. Yeah. And, and that was, uh, we were big opponents of uh, WOTUS, as I'm sure you've heard from us uh, more than once. Re-regulating 97% of and, I mean, and it was just, and it was, and <laughs> it came across very clearly as something that was, uh, being regulated from not at a local level where you, I mean, when you get down to it, it's, it's ridiculous. When it, and so it may, it may have made sense to somebody at the, at the upper level, but when it actually comes down to what it looks like in a, in a rural community, that was not the, the proper approach. So uh, we've been working a lot with the state as well for the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy and focusing on water quality, because that is a, a big issue and an ongoing issue. And it, um bordered on becoming a real urban rural issue too. Uh, you know, we're all in this together. We all want clean, healthy water. How do we do it? How do we do it together? How do we be transparent and show what works and what doesn't work? And do it more fully, like you said. If there's some federal funds available, I want those tax dollars back here. 
but I want you folks to control them. Yes, how are you? Oh, Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Um, Ken Dinevir from Clarendet, and I have I have a personal issue with Social Security Administration. It's kind of I've contacted your office about this, and I just want to pose a voice my concern of the lack of advocacy groups that are available to assist people with disabilities. I've contacted agency after agency after agency after agency. While that sounds terrible, we can't help you. There, there's basically nobody in Iowa that I've been able to get to that can, can answer questions or give direction. Okay. Uh, have you asked our office to help you to do that? Yes. Okay. And as much as I've gotten for a reply is we're waiting for a response from Social Security Administration. Okay. Well, I've spoken with Laura a couple of times. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned this. Um, because that's one thing that, aside from voting and hearings and all those kind of things that you do, when you have instances like this and others, we want to advocate for you. Now, we're advocating for a lot of people too. But right. I, I understand this, that. This takes mm -hmm. it to another level. And, um, right. They deserve a phone call from, from me. Okay. Well, like I said, my my concern that I wanted to voice for for the group is for over a month I've been calling everybody and anybody that I can and there's especially in Iowa, no groups that I found that can can offer any assistance. Okay. So you're looking for help with you have an issue with Social Security, but you're also looking for folks to help take up your cause, or at least be aware of it, to help advocate. To give me some direction on how to contend with the issue that I'm facing with Social Security, I'm facing the possible loss of my benefits, like within a couple of days. Okay. Um, Aaron, we need to take care of this. Can you stick around? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And I brought paperwork and stuff for you. Right. You've got a head start. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Um, anybody? Yeah. yeah. Congressman Young, Matt Sell, CEO of uh, Shenandoah Medical Center here. Um, I just wanted to see, obviously, my interest is primarily in health care. Um, you know, a few years ago, we, we got hit by Medicare sequestration, uh, you know, pretty hard for in a high Medicare uh, uh, community like, like we have here in Shenandoah. Uh, we also have a very high Medicaid population that we uh, provide services to. So at the state level, privatization of um, the MCOs uh, uh, over the Iowa Medicaid enterprise uh, really hit us very hard as well. In 2017, we had various bills introduced around health care, uh, many of which defunded Medicaid expansion. And so and my question for you is, you know, what do you expect in 2018? Uh, we're obviously watching that very carefully, uh, knowing that, you know, the, the loss of Medicaid expansion for us can mean, you know, several hundred thousand dollars uh, of reimbursement that we likely will not get, uh, you know, once that goes away. So I just wanted your thoughts on do you, where do you see that going in 2018 and, and what do you expect to happen? <clears throat> You know, regarding Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, mm -hmm. I don't see any really attempts to do anything with that at the federal level. Okay. Uh, now, with Social Security, Medicare, so I'm going to separate from Medicaid right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the actuaries at Social Security, Medicare say if nothing is done, you know, folks are going to get about 75% of their benefits mm -hmm. in 12 years. So we need to make sure that Social Security and Medicare are strengthened and modernized and that promise is kept for people. And it's not money that is entitled to them, it's money that is theirs and they deserve because they paid into it. I think there's a will to do that in Congress, although some people say that's the third rail of politics when you try to touch that. But it can be done, but you have to have a partnership at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue to do that in the Oval Office. And President Trump has said he just he doesn't want us 
deal with that. So we are where we are in those two programs, kind of the status quo. But we need to make sure that they are there for the people that are following. Uh, Medicaid, as you know, Iowa uh, is an expansion state. And you know, for the most part, if, if Iowa wants to stop that expansion, they can do that on their own. Mm -hmm. Now there are some certain you, know, you got to they have to a state would have to check in here and there with health and human services for Medicaid services uh, to check to see if they can do certain things uh, and have some flexibility on how they address the Medicaid population. So I would really direct those questions and they're good ones because I'm going to be meeting with uh, you know I meet as well with folks from the Fox Hoban. The director of health in Iowa, and Oman, our insurance commissioner, and I want to know what's happening too, and and, and what uh, if anything is going to change or not change. So you need to make make sure you're doing that too. And if you're having trouble getting through to them, let me know because I want to be helpful to make sure that you're heard. Particularly, I hear a lot from people who um, deal with the Medicaid population and. People are full of love and compassion, but they can't just live um, to keep this going. So, are you having some of those issues? You know, we're having. I mean, we're having some of those issues, and, and there's been certain policies enacted that have really, uh, you know, devastated our ability to get approved for payment or, or you know, providing authorization for services that you know typically we would have provided in the past. Um, you know, but most of those we, we've been trying to obviously handle at the state level. I guess my main concern was if there is a defunding of Medicaid expansion at the federal level, you know, that the state itself is going to have, uh, you know, no, no choice, uh, you know, but to obviously. Yeah, I've not heard of any efforts to defund. Okay. I, I mean, I just, there were, there were a handful of, handful of bills last year that, I felt, you know, I guess, uh, my take was that those provisions did exist. So I was just curious, uh, you know, if that if that was an issue in the team. With your, you know, hospital association yep. kind of thing, and we'll let you know if we hear anything. But so let's just work together on this and see what we hear. And also, if some changes are happening at the state level, we want to know how that affects you. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks for what you do. Yep. Sir, it seems as if there is more than one rotten apple in the uh, FBI. Uh, the House Investigating Committee has been looking into that as uh, what's going to have to be done to restore our confidence in the FBI as our top uh, agency in the country. <laughs> well, you know, we have these investigations going on. Uh, you have Mueller's investigation, the congressional investigations. And uh, I've always said, let these investigations go forward and let them go where they go. Now, I think everybody would like to see them in sooner rather than later, but you don't want to do a premature. You want to make sure that you find the facts. Um, there's been some criticism of some people within the Department of Justice or FBI. I just want to say that um, the super, super, super majority of folks working at the FBI are patriots and are doing some great work in helping to enforce our laws, fight crime, and also help us fight terrorism. Now Congress does, though, have the power of oversight. Uh, and so they're doing some oversight work. In particular, you're probably hearing about a memo uh, that the intelligence we have right now um, that they're <coughs> thinking about releasing. Um, I'm for releasing that just for transparency's sake and let that broader discussion uh, be out there uh, for everybody to see and have that conversation. But uh, I don't like broad sweeping strokes of any particular agency or department, whether it's the FBI, DOJ, Department of Education, Department of Energy. If you're going to have criticism, I think it should be um, that <coughs> justified. You don't group people's name names. So uh, I 
I imagine that memo will come out sometime within the next month or two at the latest. But that transparency is important to the agents. <coughs> um, committees have a role get to the bottom of whatever we're trying to get to the bottom of, and wherever it goes, but we want answers and we want transparency and direct people need to know that. You want to, any further comments on that? Thanks, Bob. I have just a sort of general question. Are, uh, from what you see, are things as divided and divisive in D.C. as what is portrayed to the people here? I mean, you, you'll, you'll, you hear people talk and you listen to the news or read the news, and I'm not sure I was a Republican congressman speaking to a Democratic congressman, unless they're forced to in a meeting kind of thing. And I, and I didn't know if that's if, how accurate is that or is, and, and how much uh, working together do you feel is going on? It's too bad that you don't see all the bipartisanship and the bills that are passed, co-sponsored, introduced together between Democrats and Republicans and independents that make their way to the House and the Senate floor and are passed and put into law. Anti-human trafficking bills, um, bills for veterans, education, what have you. If they're not controversial, I guess they're not going to make the news, right? Um, <laughs> Are there some folks uh, in D.C. on the left and right and in the middle who are pretty strong with their rhetoric and those make great sound bites and people begin to think, well, that's all there is out there? Unfortunately, that's part of the, <clears throat> part of the, the image or perception that's out there. There are people who are very passionate and about issues and very principled on them. And some of those issues, whether it be health care or immigration or um, other issues, it's okay to be principled and to dig in and if you really have those beliefs on those issues. But the media, I think, likes to create something bigger within their, their they are what they are. The media is necessary. And we, we need a strong, aggressive media. I would ask you to make sure that when you're seeking your news, you use a diverse sources as well. Uh, I watch everything from CM, MSNBC to CNN to Fox to PBS. I read Washington Post. I read our local newspapers. We get all the local newspapers. and um, So I have a diverse news sources. But everybody that I know in Congress, Democrat, Republican, who I've met in the House and the Senate, they are there. They, I believe that they love this country. They want better opportunity for everybody in this country. They want to keep people safe. They want a strong economy. They want a, a clean environment and strong conservation. We just have different ways of getting there sometimes. Uh, we have to find a way to honorably compromise and you can do that. You don't have to give everything up. You just may not get everything you want sometimes. It's better than it appears, to be sure. How's that? And, um, I, I vowed to not be one of those people who's out there ranting and screaming, and you see it. Uh, because those people are generally not invited to the table of solutions. And if they're not invited to the table of solutions, they're ostracized. And that means their whole people they represent are ostracized. And I'm not going to do that to the third district. And I'm just not wired that way. But I appreciate the question. Yes, sir. I'm going to take this just a little bit further, by the way. My so name good. is Jim Davey, and I'm the city administrator here. I'm going to put you on the spot, representative, because I did vote for you, so I guess I have that right. <laughs> um, and this is kind of a personal issue. Um, you're in your second term as, as representative, I believe, and I'm just kind of wondering, how is this all fitting together for you in your life, in your professional life? Are you uh, going to stick around Washington for a while, or are you kind of fed up with the, with the D.C.? Uh, you know, experience and want to do something else, kind of give us some insight. We do have a senior senator who's uh, almost immortal, but I believe he's in his 80s and he'll probably be stepping down at some point. Do you have any ambitions of maybe a higher office? So, I try you? to not look too far down the road. Um, and um, I was elected in 2014 and started uh, my first term, 2015-16, now I'm in my second term. I enjoy the work. 
I love this district. There are some challenges, of course, but I'm never going to complain. As long as I believe that I can be effective and I've got the, the passion for serving like this, I'm going to keep doing it as long as people think I'm doing an effective job. Uh, I appreciate that. But um, I, I don't, I, I make these decisions kind of one election at a time every two years. I don't want to be buried in Washington, D.C., um, 49. So, you know, there may be, a, I hope there's a career or two after this, but I just, as long as I'm doing this, I'm, I'm giving it my all. And that's why I go to every county every month and meet with anybody and everybody. And I just want that. you to know that, at least from my perspective, you're always responsive to, to any uh, requests that we make, and that's important. Uh, not that we always have to agree with you, but just you're there and we listen, and, and uh, I want you to know that uh, we all appreciate it and we wish you the best in any of your in political or our personal endeavors. You always walk in the show. <laughs> Seems like a great place to end there. <laughs> <laughs> We've got more time. Go ahead. Tom Beavers, I've been KMH for years and watched our youth develop over the years, and it seems like we have a terrible problem with drugs in our area. What about the national level? Are there any address being made on how to handle all of this imported stuff that's making it to our borders and inside? Well, I think a really mixed message has been sent to our youth and to our culture and just everybody in general. When, when drugs are illegal at the federal level, yet you have states who are legalizing drugs at the same time, what kind of message does that send? Now, I'm all for states' rights, right? I, have this. I like federalism. New York is different than Iowa. It's different than California. At the same time, we do have a federal law right now. That has to be reconciled in some way, sooner rather than later, about how this should all be. So I think our youth have been given a signal that if it's legal here and there, then it must be okay. Um, this all starts with parenting, of course, number one. Parenting, parenting, parenting. It's got to start in the home. Uh, but we are seeing, uh, it, it's been called an epidemic, especially... You know, marijuana right now is probably the least of a lot of law enforcement officers' concerns right now, or parents' concerns even. It's just weird to say that, right? Right now, we're talking about crystal meth, we're talking about fentanyl, we're talking about heroin, some really hard stuff that is killing our communities, and it's not discriminating either. We're going to Tide Pods now. <laughs> and, I mean, what's, you know, what's going on with our youth? I mean, they're trying all of these things, <clears throat> even if it's illegal. I, I don't understand their rationale. Why in the world would they ingest something that's only designed for laundry? That's a new that's the new rage right now. But anyway, yeah, no, I national level. How do how do you go into this discussion? Are there other states that are facing? I know there are, but well, this is happening. Um, you know the things I like to do. I like to get into the classrooms and talk to kids. Yeah, talk Make them with their concerns. We've got a lot of communities that are starting mentorship programs. I think that's important. Relationships matter. Accountability matters. I wish I had some better answers for you, but we part of it as well is we need to make sure that we we can just incarcerate people. There has to be interdiction as well, and we need to go. We need to we need to find a flatter who these big kingpins are who are bringing this over and selling it to us. Uh, people on the street doing it, if that's not good. People buying it, it's not good, but you have to go up the ladder. You have to find the end of this. Well, I see 95 to 99% of our kids that are ex. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, I'm proud of our kids nationwide. But it's that idea that just that fraction that's destroying, I think, our way of life. And uh, you're right about this. States' rights about marijuana. There was just a new <coughs> generation in New Jersey, is it? Or just voted it in? I mean, to me, that's just slap in the face of the government regulations. I asked you, I think the 
Department of Justice is trying to figure out a way to do that. I'm also respecting states, I don't know how they're going to do it. It would be an interesting debate. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of on the same vein, just quickly, what are your thoughts on the whole sanctuary city controversy that's going on right now? <clears throat> Sanctuary for those here and the debate if here illegally. Um, I think we have to get a, a control on who's here, who's not here, enforce our laws, secure the border. <coughs> it's a bigger issue than just sanctuary cities. And right now, as you saw, we have an issue with dreamers and the DACA issue, securing the border, looking at different immigration programs from chain migration to the visa lottery. We're going to deal with this issue, maybe not the sanctuary city issue, although we've had votes on that in Congress. But give me a perspective. Do you fear that if you cut off funding for cities or states who don't enforce federal immigration law, that that would harm public safety or Shenandoah or? Well, you know, it goes back to what you said earlier about you have laws, you need to follow them or change the law. Right. And what I'm seeing is uh, some of these sanctuary cities, or in the case of California, just thumbing their nose at the federal government and saying, we're going to do what we want to do. And to me, that kind of is, can create a small effect as far as uh, disrespect for law. You know, the offices, you see, it's like, well, they're not going to follow us, so why should I? And getting back to your, your question, though, about concerns around here, uh, I agree with you, we need to know who the individuals are that are coming in. You know, it's and it's not just people that uh, are coming for a better life. You know, we mentioned the drug issue. I mean, that that's a concern. If, if uh, we've got uh, the importation of drugs from other countries, not just Mexico, it comes in from Canada yeah. as well. Yeah. All over. And uh, you know, we, need, we need to get a handle on it. And you know, having been a former law enforcement officer, I can tell you it's extremely frustrating to, see, uh, to come across people with no identification. They're not going to tell you where they're from. Uh, you can uh, suppose, because of, of their language possibly, that it just makes uh, enforcement very, very difficult when you've got this gray area of, you know, well, we're going to allow some people here because, you know, they're, they want certain things in life too, like we do, but still you've got to have, you got to have some level of, of control over it. Otherwise, it just gets out of hand. And, and I'm really concerned about this whole thing. Respect to our federal government. It's, uh, <coughs> if we just allow, and, and I'm believing states' rights as well, but if you've got federal laws, you know, they need to be followed. Otherwise, like I said, change the law. And, uh, and I don't know if there's going to be any change in the, in the future in regards to marijuana. You know, marijuana is illegal at the federal level. Um, and the DEA agents can come into Shenandoah and, and willy nilly, or Colorado. <laughs> Dispensaries, marijuana dispensaries that there are, like grocery stores. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we uh, have some friends in a small community of, of 450 people. Yeah. You know, so that kind of shows you the, the trend that we're seeing. And I can't imagine the folks at the DEA, you know, what they're thinking when they uh, when they see that sort of thing going on. But, you know, there needs to be, like you said. Uh, issues worked out amongst the states and the federal government, but those of us in the community see this stuff and it's like, you know, what are we paying these people for? Both the state and the federal government. Let's, let's resolve this and move on. And I hope that you know, this is also concerned about this. We did pass uh, a bill <coughs> leveraging funds against cities, uh, sanctuary cities. Along with that was attached what we call Sarah's Law, remember Sarah Root, out of, out of Council Bluffs, a young lady who was killed by somebody here illegally, uh, who was drunk, drunk driver. 
the Senate has not taken that up, but, you know, activities, whether you like them or not, if there's laws regarding them, I think our laws need to be enforced because once they aren't, aren't it's kind of a, who knows where that path may go. We're going to be taking up some of these immigration issues with DACA and Dreamers here pretty soon. As you know, the president told Congress you need to deal with the DACA Dreamer issue. I think anybody have any opinion on that issue? I'd like to hear it. Thanks. Good morning. Okay. We just had another police officer in the news this morning. This is a rampage that's going on right now. You know, I don't think we can say Congress. Or no, no. Not local. <laughs> not local. No, no. It's, but Denver, wasn't it? it's, it's happening all over the United States. I don't think Congress can say we've got a huge problem that's going to address it, but this is an issue of respect. We just don't seem to have respect for the law. And I know you probably can't deal with that in Congress. It's some, you, you can deal with the law you because you've got to respect yeah. it. So I, I think you have to be very careful about this in this sense. When a law enforcement officers or a department here and there are short on maybe body cameras, something like that, there can be funds available. I don't, but I don't think we should be federalizing our local police. You got to be very careful about that. Well, another big issue: is school shootings. And there's a, I, on the news today, and I've heard it twice now, eleven school shootings. I have three family members that are teachers and just, and, and of course, grandkids and school just like you have. It's incredible. Yeah, we don't want to think that this um, is happening. Like yeah. Our hearts go out to those, mm -hmm. those families because you think what could happen. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> said this before, and many people have as well, but the e evil works out there. How do you mm -hmm. get into the heart or mind of somebody to, to prevent this and identify this? Don't. I don't know. No one has an answer on that one. Yes, sir. We have three hands popping. <laughs> just, just quickly following up, you know, on the law enforcement officer situation. Uh, again, another example of disparity is the federal level. You saw the federal law enforcement officer. That's a felony. At the local level, it's usually a, a slap on the hand test. And I've heard judges say, well, police officers have to expect that. And so, you know, again, you need to have if you assault an officer of the law, whether it's local or federal, it needs to be a serious crime. And that's how it's Again, it would be our state. <coughs> well, you get your, I think the way to approach that is get your state officials to match that up to the federal penalties. And it's the same value of those lives. And, those people. Yeah. and there's more opportunities at the local level for that sort of thing to happen. You know, a law, the law is law, whether it's state or federal, and I think uh, there needs to be equality in that respect, not just in the law enforcement, but in the other areas as well, in federal law and state law. I think you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to comment briefly, uh, hopefully briefly, on the, the DACA thing. Yeah. Um, uh, my my brother-in-law is Hispanic. He's, the, he's, a, he's got a citizenship now. He's been here for 20-some years. Uh, all of his family is, is not, uh, say, integrated in the same, into American society in the same way. Um, and he made the comment to me just recently that, uh, I think it was over Thanksgiving, visiting with his family in Chicago, and his, his sister said, you know, sometimes, they've been here for 20 years, and she said, sometimes I feel like we just got here. Meaning, because, I mean, they're, they're in their community, they're, they're in an entirely separate <coughs> environment from what, what we see, I guess, because they, the Hispanic community is very tight, and they're, I mean, they've been here for 20 years, and uh, his parents don't speak English, but they haven't, I, mean, I don't say they haven't needed to, but it's just, it's just, they've not, uh, I would say, they haven't really integrated into <coughs> American culture. I mean, they've kept their culture, which is fine. I don't want, I'm not saying they shouldn't, they should sacrifice that, but I think uh, in regard to Dasha, uh, you, you have to stop bleeding before you just start trying to put bandages on the situation. And 
between, I think, figuring out uh, a way to stabilize our, our immigration, what, however you, that ends up happening, has to be addressed before we start talking about people that are here illegally. And is it right to send the people away that have been here for 20 years? Like, I, I have a hard time feeling like that's the right answer. At the same time, I know there are people, and like my brother-in-law, I mean, he, it took him years to get a citizenship. I mean, it was 12 years of a process. And, but if, if you give citizenship to someone who broke the rules ahead of all the people trying to follow the rules, I have a problem with that. And so, um, but it, it all starts, I think, with stabilizing where we are and what our rules are going to be as far as immigration. Well, we're going to have this this debate. And we've had the debate kind of over the airwaves and actually at town halls, uh, even on the floor of Congress. But sooner rather than later, we're going, actually going to start moving legislation. And there's some groups in the House that you hear about this gang of six or gang of ten uh, in, the, in the Senate who's working on something. That's great. But, but I'm not going to be bound to that necessarily. There's a lot of kind of different ideas on this. But I, I believe that. Um, you have to marry up kind of the, the, the root of the issue, and I think some of that is within our our lack of, of having a secure border and looking at some of the other um, immigration programs that we may have. And you marry that up with <coughs> those dreamers who all they've known is America, right? Their kids, their high schoolers, they're in college now. Some are in the military. Um, I think there is a, a goodwill on both sides to be merciful, but be just at the same time to not just make this a deal, but a real solution, like you said, a solution. To give some kind of legal status that may not necessarily mean citizenship, it could have been a pathway, that all depends on, on the debate that we have. But marry that up with border security. Border security doesn't necessarily mean a wall from the Gulf of Mexico to San Diego. That's not something I support. I don't think it would be effective, and even Border Patrol agents say that's not effective. It would be too expensive. Um, borders, the sectors of the border have different needs. You need more Coast Guard in, around San Diego. You need horseback, more Border Patrol on horseback in Cochise County, Arizona. You need more drones and unmanned aerial vehicles around McAllen, Texas. But I want to make sure that we have to deal with this issue again, because it seems like we try to issues like this or other issues and in five or ten years we're doing it again. Let's find a solution where we can be compassionate and just at the same time and make sure that this doesn't happen again with kind of the American people. And uh, you know, these DACA kids, dreamers, they're in our communities. And uh, I think they they're part of our American fabric really. If that's all they know, if they really know if you send them somewhere they wouldn't they'd be a stranger in a strange land. from. You know, they're not a form of violence. Um, they can be part of that solution, but if they're violent felons, we shouldn't have them here. Where are they? Be dangerous. They're kind of giving me the hook back there. Do <laughs> <laughs> uh, have any final comments uh, for the good of the order? There is some really good news this morning on the Journal's Web. One out of six millennials has over a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. <laughs> when I grew up in the fifties, if you had a Volkswagen bus, that, that was the standard. <laughs> that was the catch. <laughs> You're the bachelor of the town. Well, thank you. Um, really appreciate you coming out and we'll be doing this again. I'll be back. We're on KMA. Of course, on Wednesday mornings. Wednesday we're mornings at 7:35. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we're in session. If not, sometimes you just see me right here. So. Thank you. And God bless you.